Welcome to the latest episode of Tech Sales Class with uh, me, James Hounslow. And today, uh, for our first recording of uh, 2023, uh, super excited, we've got Chris Dudridge on the show. Chris, welcome. How are you doing? Hi, James. Doing really well, thank you. So I just want to make sure I get this right, Chris. You are the Vice President of Sales EMEA of Sirocco, is that correct? Correct, yes. I was keen to have you on the show for a couple of reasons. One, you've obviously been... Uh, recently uh, mentioned for your abilities as a sales leader uh, in an award ceremony, but also what you've done at a number of organisations where you've built sales teams to quite an incredible ability. Uh, just wanted to try and uh, share some of that insight. We head into a year where there's been a lot of hiring. So my 18 years of recruiting and building sales teams, I haven't seen as much hiring that has gone on uh, as went on back end of 2021 and throughout the whole of 2022. And there's now that real need to galvanize those teams in what's now becoming a slightly trickier time to actually sell tech. We've got all these new people uh, within our team and we've got big targets to go after and do. Uh, and it's just like just tapping into a little bit of your wisdom as to uh, how we do about it. So before we dive into... Uh, the detail of that, it would be great if you could just uh, give our audience just a little bit of a background as to uh, who Chris is and, and what you've been doing for your uh, your journey. Perfect. Thanks, James. I think it's worrying if we use the word wisdom, but we'll just say ramblings instead. But so, yeah, Chris Edridge, I'm VP of Sales for EMEA for, for Sirocco. So Sirocco is a really interesting business. We're pre-Series A. Um, we're in a really interesting space, creating a market, uh, historically working across automation consulting, uh, then into really becoming the leader in the task mining sector, but bringing to the, the market an initiative called the Work Graph, which is essentially a scalable map of how teams work, understanding where they experience friction within your business, and then allowing typically very large enterprises, but also some commercial businesses, make decisions on that data, which will transform the way that their people work or the processes and technology that you deploy for them will transform their lives. Um, really exciting business, uh, fast growth, um, lots of lots of uh, ups and lots of downs. But I came into this uh, just under two years ago uh, from having had an experience at a company called UiPath, where... Mm -hmm. Uh, originally as a regional vice president of sales for enterprise, I then stepped into um, the, the seat as the area vice president and managing director for a much larger scale business at Series D and on its route to IPO. Uh, I also picked up that role just before COVID. So I had the experience of being a people leader during probably one of the most, more challenging times uh, in, in the past decade. Um, but fundamentally, that was an incredible scale journey that I got to be a very privileged member of where, um, you know, in the UK alone, we doubled the year, we doubled the, the business year on year uh, for the three years during my tenure uh, and set that business up to incredible success. Um, and then prior to that, I worked in the world of ERP, the sexy world of ERP and got to spend most of my days with the CFO and, 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 and the finance team as my main stakeholders. Um, but again, from maybe first person on the ground, uh, bringing them from a perpetual software business into the world of SaaS. You know, we grew with my fantastic boss that was there at the time, Fergus. We grew that business from a very small team just operating in the UK into a team that was running um, larger sales operations across Central Europe, including Benelux and the DAC region and the Nordics, uh, and also opened up uh, offices and functions in the Middle East. So I've had a bit of experience there, uh, but my career did not start in sales. I started uh, as a consultant. Um, in fact, I started on the phones in a call center to then move into back office, to then put my hand up for any job that somebody would give me that would give me an ability to understand more about how that business functioned. So I do remember a long, long while ago when I had a real job, um but yeah that, that's sort of uh in a nutshell my background loads to to sort of like dive into um and, and maybe for another podcast you're the story of how you got into sales i think it's quite an interesting one but uh, i always like to to start particularly because sales leadership for me is the hardest job in a tech company particularly a, a growth company and, I, and i'll give you my reasons behind that nine times out of ten you don't have control over what the revenue target is going to um to be you're normally given a target with not enough people to do it so you have to go out and bring people in and there's not too many technical leaders who've lost their jobs because they haven't hit a go live date so it's a super challenging position. When did you decide you wanted to be a sales 
leader to start with and what made you think at that point you'd probably be quite good at it again i don't think i ever had any any confidence that i'd be any good at it and and i think you know let, let's let the fullness of my career pan out before anyone can ever claim claim that that mantle but i i suppose before i became a sales leader i was in sales and before i was in sales i was actually doing a functional role so to your point around technical leaders not losing their roles for poor performance you know i was a consultant you know out on the road every day helping clients implement whether it was hr payroll finance solutions uh but I was curious, right? And I was really interested in how they used our technology and most importantly, how they could get more out of our technology. So I had a natural kind of curiosity as to as to how everything worked and how I could help that customer get more from what they were procuring from us. And it just so happened that the sales director realized that I was doing that quite frequently and gave me my first shot at, at being an account manager. Uh, the same for when I was moving through account management to then realizing I was uh, actually better at new business. Uh, mm -hmm was because I was probably not under any pressure, you know, coming from a prove it style mentality to really, you know, know I'd had 10 years of, of, of sales training that, that should then mean I can hit the ground running and just hit KPIs left, right and center. But I think because I had this, this patience and I grew my career by just being open to learning around how different things work without having that long sales career behind me. The next thing logically was what's beyond being an individual contributor and delivering great outcomes, you know, for myself personally was, okay, there's, there's lots of options. Many people take different courses on their, their sales career, but sales leadership for me was the next step is like taking what I'd learn and, and the curiosity that I applied to everything that I did every day and, and, and trying to see if I could coach, develop and, and help others. And like, I, I, I said this the other day to, to some, I think we both mutually know Chris Hatfield, um, yeah. who was talking about, you know, on one of his LinkedIn posts, he was talking about the, the principles of leadership and, and what it takes to lead. And I, I think if you overthink that, and I think if you don't have the natural inclination to, to have some level of selflessness and put others first, then you sort of fail at the first hurdle. But when you have the, I think the natural, uh, desire to help others and to try and coach and develop and and everything that goes underneath that around dedicating your time to them first because they're the they're the, the vehicle you use to be successful as well you know their success is, is is your success and if you have that kind of caring coaching you know uh mindset then you already have a lot of the attributes that are required to be a good sales leader that's in the early days at some of my you know team lead sales manager roles Obviously, over time, you have to develop a very different skill set, which is maybe training yourself to be able to be, you know, far more concise, far or in control of the, the, a much larger team that might include different layers of management beneath you, because you're ultimately still going to have to inspire action from every single person that reports into you. But you still have to apply that same curiosity to how can I help these people be more successful? Um, and so I think to our, that was a very long answer but to my mind it's around having the curiosity as you've been through your sales career and then when you get to the destination that may still not be the end of your career but but the job you hold at that point in time don't forget everything you've learned and everything that you understand that your team are experiencing and ensure that you imply a level of empathy to making sure you can put in mechanisms to be a great leader that appreciates all of those 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 points in terms of the success that you've had um and the, the scale particularly the scaling that you've been able to do what i found in a trend with the the amount of um sales leaders i've interviewed on this podcast and spoken to um in general there seems to be a a connection between sales leaders who started life on what you'd call the professional services side because on the professional services side there's a lot around process and having the right process in place um, and being able to build around that and being able to shape it. How much do you think that, and I, and I also think just from hearing you talk, you were probably one of the first early adopters to the true solution salesperson where you were, fight, you were using technology to solve someone's problem because you were really understanding the customer and helping them use the tech. And then you probably used that information when you went into um, into. Mm. But how 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 much of that that early stage do you think that shaped some of what you do now? D don't get me wrong. My first, you know, years as an account manager or carrying a quota weren't necessarily dissimilar to being a consultant. Mm -hmm. 
working in in the professional services function because you're right solution selling is 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 essentially using the the, the product the technology the capability whatever it is that you might sell mm-hmm. uh, and and knowing your subject matter so well that actually it allows you to to really you know understand a problem and, and, and find the solution that you can configure develop or, or employ to to take that pain away from somebody you know mm-hmm. solution selling but like i don't think that the ps to, to to sales migration that happens for some people is really a benefit in terms of like process necessarily because i'll be honest with you the, the days as a consultant were some of the, the the easiest days of my life i was fed right I, I didn't have to go find and kill and cook you know the opportunities i was told you need to be in Doncaster on Monday to go and do a day's worth of payroll consulting here. You need to be in here. And, and it was just lovely. And, and I got to hone my craft and, and really listen to business challenge and, and, and work with people who were true subject matter experts in their own field. The benefit it gives you, especially if you migrate from professional services into sales in any, any flavor is that you have business context. Mm-hmm. So that there, there, there's a there's a and I say this because it's most certainly not a barrier, but it's a challenge, right? If you come in as an SDR straight out of university, and and the first thing that you're do you're told is here's the personas that you need to sell into, here's the product value proposition that you've got, and I need you to go and phone CFOs, accounts payable officers, or I need you to phone the the sales director, or I need you to phone the supply chain director, or I need you to phone. You haven't got a clue what these people do on a daily basis. You can learn it and you can absolutely fake it till you make it. And you can you can try and be as you can you can really go in with curiosity to 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 find out, how, you know, what the hell do these people do? What is going to provide value to them from the product or service that I'm selling? But you have a, you have a massive challenge ahead of you to really understand the business context of the people you're talking to. So somebody that's come straight out of deploying an ERP technology, which understands all the pain they go through down to you know what they do every day what button they click the pressure they're under you know the terminology you name it that are set if they're transitioning to the other side of the fence and selling the buyer immediately understands you understand their problem okay so that's why a lot of people who migrate from professional services to sales not all of them but many of them are very successful if the 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 product service thing that they're selling is very closely aligned to their their business experience uh it can be taught as i'd say but it gives people such an acceleration in their career if they're then good at relating to the personas that they sell into. What we need to understand your first role as a sales leader, there there will be a lot of sales leaders this who are in their first leadership position. They got given those based on the fact that so many opportunities came up last year that that there may not have been enough sales leaders around. What would you say were your biggest learns in that first uh, role as a sales leader that you carry with you today? I think I was really, really lucky to 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 probably have been moving into sales management when it wasn't such a boom market. So it was natural progression. The timelines from going from a sales IC to a to a manager typically would took a lot longer. So it would take you a few years of honing your craft in each level in the business before you got given the next opportunity and so you really got a chance to live through a few annual cycles of each role where you understood you know how to best forecast how to best um you know to what 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 are the most effective methods of your own personal pipeline generation how is that best you know rendered upwards then you take your next step up and you're looking downwards right so you're looking down at your team and so you're able to understand a where you're being fed bullshit because you you understand you know you've been there so you said don't give me that I've been here you know and I know that that's not true um but you're also able to like look at you know the attributes that are are, are, I think the the best attributes of the best sales leaders which is inspiring action from from getting people to understand that their targets are achievable the methods of getting to them are 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 playbooks and strategies that you can also you know influence and, and, and 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 proof that work but the, 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 to answer your question, the, the things that I learned most is around things like pipeline hygiene and, and you know, understanding the reality of how long something would take to close, not having a good conversation and, and, and forecasting it, you know, for to happen three weeks from now, but actually understanding these things take time. What are those things? And so I suppose as a manager, I had a lot of time to to really experience how my team worked the best ways of, of of setting up a cadence of review that gave me enough time to 
establish where they were at and make sure that when I had to pass that up the chain to my superiors, that I had the time to consider what did reality look like. And so for, for the vast majority of my career, I was very good at forecasting, you know, with some level of intuition, but also some level of experience of, um, of having done it. So I carried that the entire way through because I've held every role in sales up to my, my current level. One of the areas that is, is the big challenge is hiring. If you're in a in a scale up business that has received funding um, and and you need to grow, how do you set yourself out focusing on on what you need to hire against what you want to hire? Um, and what I mean by that is it's quite easy to just say right to a recruiter, I need someone with a Rolodex in their space uh, who's had success in it. What would be your advice to to someone who's who's just received some funding? Um, because there are so many companies out there who have, um, and they don't have enough headcount in place. What's the the starting point um, that you do when it's like, right, I need to hire someone? When I look at the the needs for the business, and and it's quite a broad question, this one, so I'll try and, uh, and tackle it and answer it again, as I've failed on a couple of occasions previously. Um, you know, when I need to hire, the demand will be very clear, okay, because it will all really come based on are we able to service the work we presently have so you know it, it, it it's it's very complex now because of all the different channels that, that that have always existed but when you look at digital when you look at you know your own kind of personal outreach when you look at all of the the things that contribute to generating pipeline for the sales team and i'm just talking sales specifically at the moment you know you you can very quickly establish whether you have the right uh the right headcount or whether actually you're seeing the follow-ups being slow the the ability to service the customer demand and that will come from actually having a nice problem to have which is you know customers would have to wait you can't just jump immediately on a call with them because you have an available resource to do it you're actually stuck with the inability to service the amount of demand you've got now that's a problem that or that's a, a challenge that many companies have have not addressed mm-hmm. when they've gone on these rampant hiring exercises and, and i've seen it myself where you've got people waiting for something to happen where you've got resource where you know that despite them using all their spare time to prospect and try and fix the pipeline deficit they may have there is sometimes instances where you have too many people all competing for very limited uh, opportunity. So I think you have to be able to very quickly gauge where you're at capacity, whether you're under capacity, or actually, as we've seen in some other very large corporate sales organizations recently, where you're massively over capacity and need to make some course correction. So that, that that's the need. And there's so many other factors to it. We could probably be talking about this for, for, for hours, but, yeah. you know, what you then want to hire is a is a really important thing that you have to get right. So whether you're working with search partners or whether you're working with your internal teams on on defining the role, the case has to be very clear. It is this particular role we're looking to hire for. Mm-hmm. There's hygiene factors. Uh, the amount of times I've seen that we've gone out to hire for a, an EAE or a sales engineer or whatever it might be, and we're using a two-year-old job description, which doesn't really match what you need now with all the knowledge you have today. So there's the hygiene factors you need to take care of. But then you've really got to think at this moment in this market, even though there's quite a lot of candidates available, you've got to think about how you're setting out to to, to, to entice the right candidates because you will have a lot of applications for jobs at the moment, but the, the quality of some of those may be low or the, the suitability of the candidates to the role you're looking for may be low if you're not very clear with the type of, of person you're looking for. Um, and then you also have to think about all the factors that you know are going to benefit your business. And that is going to be, for me, cultural alignment. Mm-hmm. Uh, you talk about Black Book, you know, there's no doubt that there is a uh, there, there's value in network, but network can often be a dangerous thing as well. I'll, I'll sort of maybe finish on that point if we have time. There's experience, there's the, you know, there's the the, the coachability, there's the, the you know, the, the level that they sit within the organisation. Are you going to take someone you develop? Are you going to take someone that can do it in their sleep? Or are you going to go over ambitious and try and hire for the future? But when all of those things are considered, you, you know, this is what you have to have as a ritual with your probably very expert, incredibly well-connected uh, search consulting organization that can go out and find those people within a couple of moments. Or are you going to you know, work with your internal teams for, for the odd role here, there and everywhere? Either way, you have to make sure those attributes are clear in the job description and, and, and 
um, and that they're able to qualify that these candidates come through. I'll come back to the network conversation because I, I think that's really important. For too many years, everyone's gone, they've been successful here or they've you know they've built a huge book of business here for the last five years. They're going to be a success for you. Now, I, I would say that that fact is, is, is a 50-50. In some instances, it gives them a very close network where they've sold successfully in the past. But is your technology delivering the same value or the same outcomes or something that is is likely that that previous network is going to buy from this person? I think that question is often overlooked. Just because you have a relationship where you've sold them stationary at one company doesn't mean that you're then going to be able to sell them enterprise tech at another. Bad example. But you have to think about that network. And so often that then comes from helping refine the focus of what type of profiles would suit your your need for the business. And in my mind, that's identifying a list of companies, uh, often competitors, but also, you know, uh, adjacent businesses that will have a very similar go to market, a very similar uh, approach to hiring and developing and coaching talent may use the same sales, sales methodologies may have been managed by someone, you know, in the network that is a really good manager and likely is going to set them up for success. And the last thing, which is most important is understand your comp ranges. Mm -hmm. The amount of interviews, that I, I end up having with people when the, 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 the final and or first question that's qualified is what are you looking for in terms of compensation? And they're looking for a 50K boost on their, on their base and, and OTE because they just see that the market is paying that for certain other roles. Very, you'd be very clear with everyone, yourself included, and the candidates, what the you know the the can dos are in terms of compensation and benefits. Because there's nothing worse than delivering an hour's worth of your time to then come to find out that someone is um, is out of range. Um, and 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 as I say, we could go deeper and deeper and deeper. I I do often simplify it to three things when I'm speaking to to candidates after those things have been qualified: is can they do the job? Mm -hmm. Will they do the job? And will they fit in culturally? And, and, and the rest of those things, if qualified correctly, will typically lead to, to, to you having a good pool of people to make decisions on when you're lucky enough to be growing your team. Awesome. I'll come back to those, those three points. The first bit I want to just take a, a, a closer look under the, the hood, because I think it's really important, because you mentioned something at the, the outset, is um, when demand is there, when there isn't enough salespeople to speak to the clients that want to speak to you about um, about your product. And the reason why I want to dive into that, because there are so many um, sales leaders that as soon as funding arrives, it's boom, let's go get these salespeople. And they normally want the salesperson to go and generate these opportunities. And, you know, the word hustler um, gets mentioned um, a lot. Um, and it's like, right, just get on the phone and just and just call people, uh, which I think is obviously uh, necessary in the startup world. You can't rely solely on a developing marketing team. You, you, I think, you know, particularly if you if you interview any A player, you'll find that 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 some of their business comes from what's been uh, given to them from the marketing and and other thing, other parts is, is self-made. What advice would you give to a sales leader where the funding derived and it's like just don't next day um, after you've celebrated the uh, the money here in the bank picking up the phone to the to the recruiters and going right now we need to go and get some some salespeople. It's a really hard one to answer that tr truthfully because you know th there's there's both history and then the anecdote to both of those points you know you cannot say that some of the um the companies in recent times haven't done well with funding and gone out and 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 and, and made their way in the market through through aggressive investment you know there's no doubt organizations that might start later than other you know uh, established players let's talk b2b SaaS, right so b2b SaaS, you know there's many players often in each category they're all vying for that top right quadrant position in whatever uh, market they operate in those that have clarity that have some level of cost control that are on a good run are going to get or historically would get you know great levels of funding now demand if there's demand for your product and there's even you know a way in which that future demand can also be um driven by by these hires to your point about self-prospecting as one of the kind of hustler mentalities that that you may expect then then it does have a net multiplier 
The problem is, is that there are also organisations that didn't fall into that category where they thought about that and they just hired at any cost and, and sat people down, you know, let them fight over lists and, and, and territories and patches and, and uh, various different things without fundamentally having verified that there's enough opportunity to, or there is the opportunity to generate pipeline at the pace that would be necessary to, to sustain that headcount. Yeah. You've seen it, 10% layoffs, 20% layoffs, you know, some instances layoffs that are so devastating that they've actually taken entire regions out of a global um, a global business based on performance. Now, there's no one thing on, in, a, in a quick call like this that we could kind of really unpack uh, around what some of them got wrong, Yeah. Um, because some of them got it really right. Yeah. But if the funding has arrived, and, and let's assume that all of the you know the business health the kpis that they're they're asked to operate under whether they're the, the the kpis that have been instituted by the new investors or whether they're just actually people that understand their market their marketing you know how they go to market and most importantly that they're closing with the velocity that's necessary to sustain that top line growth that they're aiming for then they just have to apply that logic to hiring okay and I don't think it's as dramatic as saying they've just got out of funding and everyone goes, you know, crazy on hiring. Some some have, but I think realistically there is an instruction uh, where that growth is expected. Yeah. Um, sometimes it is assumptive and sometimes it is based on having to have hustlers come in and make a difference by being present within that business. I have seen some of the world's best self prospectors uh, who are then they, they may not be young, they may not be older, they may not be the most experienced, they may not, you know, they may not be the most junior, but they have something personally, which motivates them to get up every day, look at their list of objectives, prioritize them accordingly. They've got high EQ, they're incredibly uh, good on the phones, or they're very good with digital outreach, or they network in the right areas. They make a material impact that you often, that often comes as a surprise. Yeah. What's the alternative to that? It's people that turn up and sit back and wait to be fed. And if you don't have the demand gen routines, you don't have outreach that, that is making a difference. You don't have marketing generation or product-led growth that's pulling in customers to say, hey, we want to use your sexy bit of tech. Then you are going to have a hell of a lot of people sitting on low percentage numbers at the end of that first year that, that, are, that are passengers to your journey. And, and passengers do exist in every company. It's, it's, it's a cautious level of calculation that's required to when and where you need talent. And if you expect that hustler mentality, you, you better damn sure hope that the, the technology that they will be given or the product that they're given to take to market has uh, a perception of market value from the buyers that, that exist at the moment in time. Yeah, um, totally get that. I had uh, a founder from Israel who... Uh, I spoke it through as you have the energy people and the weights um, that you have. And he said, you just got to make sure that the energy people outweigh the, the, uh, the weighted people. Um, yeah, yeah, that will, that will lead, you know, that it's infectious, right? Success is infectious in some organizations as well. So if you see people that are, that are either good leaders or good ICs that share expertise and, and are very present in the business, they're going to have an infectious reaction to people that are around them. Then there's all these people that can't be, convinced otherwise that, that that their time is to be spent monday to friday you know as early as you can till as late as you can driving you know the outcomes because they're the people that typically earn uh, a very large sum of money every year based on the effort that they put in absolutely uh, so i just want to go back to the um the three points that you made there so um when you're looking at hiring someone um can they do the job will they do the job and are they a, a cultural fit just breaking those down into um, into the three, uh, because interviewing is, is is super challenging. What do you have in your process, uh, your interview process, to help you identify? Let's look first off. Can they do the job? How how are you interviewing, testing to find out if they can do the job? So can is aptitude. Mm -hmm. So it's qualified based on a variety of different things. Depends on how you interact with candidates, but. Typically, you'll have a, an intro call, then you'll do something qualitative, and then typically it'll be a peer interview and an offer. Uh, so you've got to get it right, and you've got to structure around it. 
I don't believe there's any kind of tests or exercises you can make people that will truly 100% categorically give you, you know, a perfect benchmark of, of, of someone's skill. Uh, but typically, you know, when you look at um, aptitude, you ask people to talk about their deals, their experience of closing complex sales cycles, you know, well, sorry, their experience of selling and, and, and you're looking for managing complex sales cycles with, with you know, lar large numbers of stakeholders selling at the very highest level. And you know as well as I do that the people can typically reference very quickly at what level are they operating in the business and yeah. you just have to gauge if you're hiring someone to do SMB or, or commercial sales and they're used to selling to C minus one to you know operational leaders you know whatever it may be that might be fine but if you're looking at someone to sell enterprise agreements to, to fortune 500 companies then you want to know that they've got some gravitas at the c-suite talking you through complex deals then also talking to you know some of the more generic old-fashioned questions that still work which is like explain to me something you're proud of explain to me something that was a big challenge for you in your career and how you overcome it just to get that kind of aptitude within the role will they do the job is a skill will piece you know and i know that even in an hour's worth of conversation with with anyone you speak to uh when you talk about their goals and their, their their personal professional lens on what they want to achieve or, or or what they have achieved you can very quickly understand someone's level of skill at communicating with you because typically i'm talking here sales and a lot of that comes from how strong a communicator you are how quickly you can build rapport how articulate you may be blah 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 but then importantly around goals personal or professional the the, the will can be very quickly derived from that and proved based on on other evidences if you want to go down to that level but typically that all comes from how much you trust that what you're being told by someone really matches up to what you need in terms of drive i have been told in the past i'm the most you know by by other candidates they're yeah. the most motivated driven hungry person in the world and i've then seen the complete opposite six months later so you don't always get it right but then cultural fit is a two-way street mm -hmm. you know Every organization is, is very different. Every organization has its nuance and its quirks. Uh, you have to think of that person next to your team, that person with your suggested manager, that person with you. That, you know, would you spend you know, time with that person on the train to, to, to Manchester or, or out? And then importantly, do they have that, that character that would also mean that those you already have are gonna want to work with them, they'd see them being a good part of the team. And, and it's a really difficult and challenging one because sometimes the the, the A players that, that exist in the marketplace, they can also be lone wolves mm. um, who, who have an incredible career behind them, but their dogged determination to be successful means they're not the most collaborative or the most kind of warm or, or uh, team player style person, but they may be somebody that some uh, they may be somebody that you need. But if you're going on a journey where all of the answers aren't there, the team need to stick together, help each other to, to kind of help you, then often you have to look at that as being a mismatch in terms of culture. Also where we're at in our journey, somebody that's worked in a corporate for, for 25 years coming to join a pre-series A startup like Sirocco may have a real challenge in understanding all the plumbing is not there. Whereas somebody that's worked in a startup for the last five years and jumped through some really successful IPOs is going to go into a company that's got rules, regulations, processes, SLAs and turnarounds and, you know, and, and, and stuff. And they're going to think crisis is slow. And, and so you have to think about the culture of who and what you're hiring for. And I think they are in reverse order more important. So culture is the most important fit. Uh, will is motivation, uh, I think, is is secondary. Uh, and then can they do the job is is your qualification to whether you'll bring them on board to go and do what you're expecting them to do. Is such a challenging part. How do you, when you're interviewing, do you take on the role that you're trying to find out all three of those or do you trust other people in the process to identify uh, one or two of those, uh, those markers? Uh, and again, every interviewer, is going to approach an interview differently. Uh, yeah. you, you try and create some consistency, but you equally want to have some stamp on the style that you want to deploy when you're interviewing someone. Mine's very conversational. Yeah. So I, I will often, you know, I could I could have questions listed out that would answer these things for me, but I can typically pick from the way they answer certain questions. I, I As an example, I'll typically give 10 to 15 minutes for them to introduce themselves, to explain their background, what, what, what you know what they understand about the role to show that they've qualified they've researched you know so that they've qualified us they've researched the business all those different things and i, I will look at 
and listen intently to those first 15 minutes to show to, to try and gauge all of these three components in equal measure. I'll then know things which are questions as to not enough detail around this or, or, or hasn't even answered questions about who they are as a person. So, you know, they're all professional and no fun. Tell me a bit more about yourself outside of work, you know, uh, and, and I, I hate the tweet questions, but it, it is things like, you know, how would your friends describe you? You know, yeah. uh, they're all really good questions and you just get very used to, to asking them in a way that makes sense that you can qualify those things. But I can get most of those, I think, to a very, in my view, pretty good level of of, uh, of confidence on within the first 30 minutes, but then I'll always have a follow on. I also trust my teams if I'm coaching them in the right way. If I've, you know, I've already leveled up managers into my team to try and act predictably on my behalf. And most importantly, to be able to do what I'm doing with their teams and make sure that we're doing the right things for our people because they're the most important asset that we have. Uh, I trust them more than I trust myself typically on making the judgment calls on these things because often they'll be managing these, these individuals. So, so yeah, I don't, I don't think it's difficult to, to coach. I most importantly think it's also important that, that they do it in a way that gives them the chance to answer these three, four, five things that are important to them. Before we come to end, there's a couple of, of more points I'd like to pick up on, but this is the opportunity uh, where you get to uh, swing this round and you get to ask me a question that you've always wanted to uh, ask a recruiter uh, and I'll do my best to, to answer it on the spot. How do you approach a new search? Yeah, how do you think about if somebody's giving you all the detail you need around the job description, the compensationary bands, you know, the the logistics, the 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 bias, the whatever they might want to put into it? How how do you approach that as a project? Because it strikes me it's the most complex project because uh, these things are all very difficult to find. Yeah. So 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 what we try to do is, is when you're qualifying a role we go into a lot of detail and what we're trying to do is is encourage the um the leadership to understand that particularly when you took a look at the three points that you that you spoke about can they do the job will they do the job culturally um are they right and the two biggest ones in there for us is are they culturally right and do they want to do the job because you want to have people that want to come and work with you. Can they do the job is an interesting one because a lot of people will refer to can they do the job as have they been doing the same thing somewhere else rather than can they, are they actually capable of selling your product? Because then you, you open up a larger world of where you can go and look and that makes it much more interesting. Um, when people are trying to really narrow in on a on a really certain thing which and sometimes particularly in the trade tech world you need that because you've got to have a certain knowledge and experience but in a large uh, space of it you don't necessarily need that so it then opens up um what you can actually go out and look to and um, and talk to and then we're just looking at basically the the key things for us are what's the size of products they sell in the the value the deal value of what they're selling who they're selling to what's similar uh, what can step up into it? So I, if it is a larger enterprise, is there an SMB that's ready to step up? What's the closest match to it? Um, and we map through it there. People who've been on a journey. So we like to look at how long they've been in organizations, where that organization has gone from when they were at it um, and really map it. We, 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 before we talk to people, it's a bit like before you chop down the, uh, the forest, you sharpen the ax. Uh, for three hours, we do a lot of mapping and researching and really understanding the business um, and what it is and where it goes before we then start our outreach. Because it's easy to go to somebody you know um, and do it. And, and, and quite often, you know, say when people say, look, I'd love to see this is our competitor, they've done really well. I'd love to see that person. And I was like, that's a great idea. Someone who's been selling something that you've been doing in an organization that's doing well, who could sit there and sell your products. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So what they're going to do is they're going to phone up your client and say, I know last week I told you this was really good, but actually I've changed my mind. This one's actually really good. What perception does the client then have of that person? So it's, it's actually thinking about what you're trying to achieve. And the biggest part um, that I, you know, when you when you're looking to hire someone that kind of stops the manager in their tracks is go what do you want this person to achieve in the next 12 months yeah and then they're like uh, they'll give you a monetary value with this it's like no but 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 what are they trying to get to what do you what what does good and great look like and then we'll match that to a skill set 
That's a really, really great point. It's a really great point. I think I think those that do that well in terms of testing the customers they're working with yeah. or testing testing the, the the recruiting companies or managers on exactly and specifically what they want to do in a way they can translate to their candidates. That that's a, a really, really valuable skill. Right. Last quite last question then. In person or or remote preference for interviews? And and what's your thoughts on the merits of, of each? It's such a, a tough because everything was in person and then everything removed to being able to be done remotely um, like this. I think in the, it, you have to be able to do both because of how the, the world has moved. Um, you can now hire with, particularly with like the different companies that are out there, you can hire somebody in any country now quite easily and have them on your, on your books um, and it becomes less easy to uh, get about. I think a lot of people, a lot of particularly startups are, I think using the bit of saving money by not having to travel, but also using the saving the planet by not traveling so much to do it. If I openly, honestly say, if it's a critical hire, uh, go and see them. Great. If it's really important. I didn't, want to tell you, I didn't want to have to tell you you were wrong until you closed yeah. that. But yeah, yeah. I, I completely agree. If it's, if it's critical, you've got, to, you've got to see the whites in their eye and sit down there and talk to them and, and really understand who they are for sure. That's, that would be my opinion. Before I let you go, you're in this pre-series A. What made you decide to join these guys and where are you going? What can we expect from you guys? Soroka is a fantastically exciting company. You know, mm-hmm. There's a reason why I chose to work for them. Um, Founders, is a truly inspirational guy, but the, the entire leadership team and all the people we have around us are really interesting. We're creating a market. Um, we're solving problems that, that are big ticket problems and many of our clients are proving that. And I know no two days are the same. You know, I, I get a chance to build a team from the ground up and truly go through that journey. Sadly, not having founded it myself, but being early enough that I can can be one of those people that 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 really stuck with it until we delivered something meaningful. I think watch this space. You know, Soroco is a very fast growing company, and uh, I uh, I'm excited about the year ahead and, and the years beyond. Awesome. Uh, well, Chris, I really appreciate you taking time out and uh, and just sharing a little bit of insight into uh, how you've achieved what you've achieved. And uh, I know the uh, the listeners will um, will take uh, uh, some definite bits out of there and uh, and implement it into uh, into what they're trying to achieve this year. So, wish you all the best with uh, 2023. But I'm sure, as always, uh, it'll be successful for you. Thanks, James. I really appreciate that, and I'll see you soon. 